Walters is hosting the ultimate Nats watch party this Saturday night at 6 o'clock while the team is in Philadelphia. A pair of racing presidents will be on hand for photo ops from 6 to 7. First place in the raffle wins a signed C.J. Abrams jersey and four Champions Club tickets. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. the set. 2-2 two, two delivery. Swing and a chopping ground ball right side. Stott backs up field. They'll get the out at second. Now throwing to the plate. The throw there. Not in time. Nunez dives across the plate with a tying run. And the pitch bunted third base side. Tatum went back to third. And the ball goes past Finnegan and all hands are safe. There was no chance Finnegan was going to field that ball or Tatum was going to get back to third for a play at third. Oh my, as he had a rough few games at third base for the Nationals. At times looks like he's never played third base before. Marsh at third, Stevenson at second, Schwarber at first, the pitch. Swinging a fly ball, left field, it's going to be over Wood's head, and this ball is off the wall, in play, and the game is over. Marsh scores on a walk-off single off the left field wall for Trey Turner, and the Phillies win it by the score of 3-2. to two. And welcome to Nats Chat for Saturday, August 17th, 2024, along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. The Nationals on Friday evening in Game 2 of a four-game series at the National League East leading Philadelphia Phillies did rally. The Nats overcame a 2-0 ninth-inning deficit, scored two runs in the top of the ninth off Phillies closer Carlos Estevez, but... Kyle Finnegan in the bottom of the ninth, a ladder run, and got no outs. He faced four batters, got no outs. The Nats lost a 3-2 walk-off loss at the Phillies. Ex-Nat Trey Turner, a walk-off, bases loaded, RBI single off the left field wall to cap a four-hit game for him. The Nats for this regular season now, a season-worst 13 games below 500 at 55 and 68. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by tonight's Scooby-Doo Night for the Fred Nats in Fredericksburg, Virginia, first round pick Seaver King and the rest of the Fred Nats will be taking the field in Scooby-Doo themed jerseys. Get your tickets now at FredNats.com forward slash tickets. The Nats on Friday evening could have used some uh, Scooby snacks with the uh, runners in scoring position. The Nats in this game had chances. The Nats actually out hit the Phillies 11-10. The Nats drew two walks. The Nats, in fact, had at least one base runner in every inning of the game. But the Nats went just one for nine with runners in scoring position. We in that Phillies one run bottom of the ninth uh, did have some more bad defense by the Nats to go with another bad outing by Kyle Finnegan. And Mark, the result was a uh, rather frustrating loss for the Nats in this game. Yeah, well, to stick with the theme, Al, the Nats would have gotten away with this one if not for those pesky defenders in the bottom of the ninth that uh, blew this game for them in my mind. I understand that Kyle Finnegan takes the loss there. And I'm not going to sit here and try to say that I thought that he pitched well, but two critical defensive mistakes, including the first one by Alex Call, completely changed that inning. And who knows how it goes after that point if they just make the clean play that they needed to make. It put Finnegan in an almost impossible situation by the time that Kyle Schwarber and then Trey Turner came up. And so what really was looking like an encouraging night and a really impressive, inspiring rally by them in the top of the ninth. It just fizzled out immediately 
And yes, Finnegan's part of it, but to me, the defense behind him set him up for failure. Yeah, so with the Nats bullpen in this game, things were going well, but ultimately four Nats relievers combined to allow one run in three and two-thirds innings. Uh, Jacob Barnes, he tossed one and two-thirds scoreless and hitless innings. Robert Garcia, perfect bottom of the seventh. Derek Law, scoreless and hitless bottom of the eighth. And then came Kyle Finnegan in the bottom of the ninth. He gave up a leadoff single by Brandon Marsh off the bottom of the right field wall. And Marsh then reached second base on a throwing error by right fielder Alex Cole. The throwing error was bad. I don't know where that ball was going. That was like airmail big time. But let's note this. Marsh's single per stat cast, highest exit velocity of the game, 108.3 miles per hour. That was uh, quite the shot that Finnegan gave up for that leadoff single by Marsh. Then came a bunt single by Cal Stevenson on a bunt to a vacant portion of the left side of the infield. We'll get into what exactly happened there momentarily. Then Finnegan issued an intentional walk of ex-Nat Kyle Schwarber to load the bases. It's worth noting, this was not like a direct intentional walk. Schwarber was up 3-0. Then the uh, plate appearance became an intentional walk. And then came the walk-off single. Finnegan giving up a walk-off bases loaded RBI single by ex-Nat Trey Turner off the left field wall for a 3-2 Nats loss. Despite Finnegan having had Turner down in the count, at 1.12. So this is one of those walk-off singles that was more like, you know, a walk-off extra base hit, but it goes down as a single. So Finnegan now has allowed at least one earned run for the fourth time in seven appearances. But to your point about the defense, the call throwing error, and then what from your vantage point happened on the Cal Stevenson bunt? On the bunt, what seemed to me to be the case, okay, you have a different, a few different plays you can set for the defense on a bunt play where there's a runner on second. One of them is the wheel play, which means the third baseman charges, fields the ball, and the shortstop trails behind him, wheels around to cover third base. C.J. Abrams was nowhere in sight, so the wheel play could not have been on. He was covering second base. So in that case, if the bunt gets down, the third baseman and the pitcher have to communicate who's going to field it. And if the pitcher is going to field it, then the third baseman stays back and it's his job to cover the bag. The ball to me was the third baseman's ball. I don't think there was any chance ever for Finnegan to get to it. And even if he did, I don't think there was any chance to get the runner who was well down the line at that point. So in that moment, Jose Tena needs to just charge the ball, field it, get the out at first base. Now, you still got a runner on third. I get it. But you get the out at least. And instead, it just made a mess of the whole thing. And then to go back to the call play, by getting to the ball as quickly as he did, he was going to hold Marsh to the single. You know, off the bat, you're saying, yeah, oh man, that's a double off the wall. Well, no, he played it so well that Marsh had to hold up around first. And all you've got to do at that point, just make the good solid throw to second. You're not trying to throw him out. Just get the ball into the second baseman. And instead, he tries to play the hero, throws it away, and now you just let him take second and get into scoring position. And I feel like, I understand Alex Call has done some really nice things since coming up here. But this is the Alex Call we saw a lot last year. When he makes mistakes, it's because he's trying too hard to make things happen, both at the plate, in the field, on the bases. And I thought that was a prime example of it. You fielded it well. You held him to first. Just get the ball in. Don't try to be the hero in that moment. Did you have a problem with intentionally walking Schwarber? No, because at that point, you now have you know the runner on third. A double play is not going to get you out of the inning. So it was pretty clear they're pitching around him. I, I don't think it was from the start go after him. You know, nothing was really close. So it's, you know what? Load him up, take your chances with Trey Turner now, and with a force out of the plate, you know, it's the last desperation move. Bases loaded, nobody out. But to me, in that scenario, I'd rather at least have that shot than saying, okay, Schwarber, swing the bat and hope that he either strikes out, which I guess that's your your ultimate hope there, or that he somehow hits the ball on the ground to get an out at the plate. He's a fly ball guy. To me, you know, neither one's a great scenario, but I'd rather have the bases loaded and at least have a force out at the plate. Yeah, I didn't have a problem with it either. It just was tough to take <laughs> the inning playing out like this where Finnegan doesn't get a single out. The defense was not good. That's true. But Finnegan wasn't good either. And he gives up that supremely well hit single by Marsh to begin things. And like you right away say to yourself, we know how, how it is with Finnegan, right? He either has it or he doesn't. 
And when he does that to the first batter he faces, you say to yourself, oh boy, like here we go. Finnegan doesn't have it in this game. And sure enough, he didn't. And, you know, even if Cole doesn't commit that throwing error, I mean, who knows how the rest of the inning goes. But, you know, he gave up the hard hit to Trey Turner. Like I said, that was not a walk-off quote-unquote single in reality. That was more like a double or even a triple for Turner. Who knows what would have happened. And he had fin- uh, Finnegan had Turner down one, two. So another example of Finnegan in an inning in which he gives up at least a run, has a batter down, doesn't put him away, and you end up with the batter reaching base. So, you know, I think both things are true. The defense was not good for sure, but Finnegan needs to be better than this. This was a winnable game, tied at two, and he does not even get a single out. Yeah. So here's what I saw with him. The first hit, the Marsh hits on a fastball right down the pipe on a 3-1 count. So he's already fallen behind. He was not throwing his fastball for strikes. Then he grooves one down the middle and Marsh hits it really well, as you said, for the you know single, but probably looks like a double off the bat. And then what does he do after that? He starts throwing a lot of splitters, off-speed stuff. And to me, and I, I'm not there, so I didn't talk to him afterwards. So I don't know what he's thinking, but it looked like to me he had lost faith in the fastball or just didn't feel command of the fastball. So now he's got to try to fool them with the off-speed stuff. The splitter works well playing off the fastball. And when he gets it down in the zone, if they're not anticipating the fastball, well, they can sit on the splitter and he wasn't throwing them that effectively because they were up in the zone. And then the last pitch to Trey Turner for the hit I know Dan and Franny on the broadcast called it a splitter. And that's what I thought at first, too, because it was 87 miles an hour. Go back and look at the stat cast on it. It was a slider. It was the only breaking ball he threw the entire inning. And it came in at the exact same velocity. And it was up in the zone as well. I think we talked a week or two ago when he was really struggling about this need for a third pitch, need to adjust the hitter's timing somewhat. And that's supposed to be an off-speed pitch, a breaking ball. I remember talking to him in spring training. He was starting to use a sweeper that was coming in in the low 80s. And the idea was have something that really changes the velocity and makes the hitter have to think about a couple different things. And it's not just about the movement of the pitch, but the velocity of the pitch. And I don't know if he's gone back to the slider he used to throw or just throwing it harder or whatever. But he threw that at the exact same velocity as the splitter. So if you're the hitter, you just got to pick up the spin on it, the timing they had to have down because it's coming in the same velocity. This is something I think he needs to get better at to develop a third pitch and something that comes in at a slower speed because otherwise you're asking the fastball and the splitter to be perfect. And we know he's just not always going to be perfect with his command. It's a shame, too, because the bullpen was having such a good game. Barnes, Garcia, and Law combining for three and two-thirds scoreless and hitless innings. And when you add that to what Patrick Corbin did in this game, and no, Corbin was not lights out or anything like that, but two runs in four and a third innings, the Nats pitching in this game was actually doing a pretty good job, all things considered. Now, look, ultimately, the Nats lost this game because of their offense. You know, we make a big deal out of what happened with Finnegan because the Nats lose the game in walk-off fashion. But yeah, like the storyline for this game going into that ninth was actually how well the Nats pitching was doing in this game off what we saw on Thursday evening. Yeah, agreed. And I, I think, I know the line doesn't look great for Corbin and he threw a ton of pitches and didn't last very long. I thought he pitched about as well as we've seen him in a while. And I give the Phillies credit. They were laying off some really tough pitches just off the plate and fouling some others off, extending their at bats, and then ultimately, you know, connecting when he would make a mistake. But I thought for the most part, he was making some quality pitches. Slider was really good. He was adjusting his speed. You saw the different uh, velocities on his slider, some in the 70s, some in the 80s. That's something he's been trying to work on. Um, I actually give him credit here. I know. We've talked so much over the last few years about how he just keeps doing the same thing and hoping for better results. I saw in this game, and I think he's done it a few other times, but this is probably the most effective he's been at it, actually trying to do some different things, changing his velocity on the slider, throwing different versions of it, not relying on the fastball as much. And I thought, given who he was facing, that lineup, I thought he did a really good job. And I think the trouble he got into, the success the Phillies had, was more a result of the Phillies' really good hitters than it was his poor pitching. Two runs in four in a third innings. Uh, Corbin gave up seven hits, a double, and six singles. Issued two walks. Only recorded two strikeouts. And like Mark said, a lot of pitches. Four and a third innings. Uh, 96 pitches, 58 strikes versus 38 balls. <laughs>
Fredericksburg Nationals. When it comes to fun, we hit a home run. Zoinks! The Scooby-Doo gang is on the way to Virginia Credit Union Stadium tonight. Join those meddling kids and solve clues throughout the evening to figure out the mystery at the ballpark. The Fred Nats will also be taking the field in Scooby-Doo themed jerseys presented by Germana Community College. Stick around after the game to bid live on some of the jerseys. This week is also your first chance to see the Nationals 2024 top two draft picks. Seaver King and Caleb Loma Vida are making their debuts with the Fred Nats. Catch the future stars of the Washington Nationals right down the road in Fredericksburg. Get tickets now at frednats.com forward slash tickets. Fredericksburg Nationals. When it comes to fun, we hit a home run. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This podcast is supported by IPVanish VPN. If you care about the security of your online activity, the easiest way to protect yourself is with IPVanish. With a rating of excellent on Trustpilot, IPVanish provides an encrypted connection for all your internet traffic, helping to prevent websites, Wi-Fi providers, and hackers from intercepting your data. Help keep your financial details, personal information, and online activity safe from threats with IPVanish. Get started with this limited time offer and save 83% on your two-year subscription. Visit ipvanish.com slash bluewire. That's ipvanish.com slash bluewire. Estevez sets the big righty with the kick and the pitch. Swinging a ground ball up the middle. Past the diving start of base hit center field. Garcia around third being waved home. Speeding to third is Nassim Nunez. The tying run on a single up the middle and a run batted in for Jose Tena. His third is a national Three hits in a row to start the ninth inning of the Nats on the board. It's down the Phillies two of the Nationals one with a tying run 90 feet away. And Jacob Young coming up. When it comes to why the Nats lost this game 3-2 in walk-off fashion at the Phillies on Friday evening, you do have to highlight the offense as much as anything. And this was a strange game for the Nats offensively. So they were facing the Phillies ace, or if not ace, then certainly one of the Phillies' better pitchers. I mean, take your pick, Nola or Zach Wheeler is the Phillies' ace, but Aaron Nola was the Phillies' starting pitcher in this game. Nola ultimately tossed six and two-thirds scoreless innings despite giving up seven hits and issuing two walks. The Nats in this game, 11 hits, two doubles and nine singles, two walks, also drew a hit by pitch, uh, but the Nats went one for nine with runners in scoring position. I mentioned this at the top of the show Every inning in this game for the Nats featured at least one base runner. And as the game was going on, I said to myself, okay, this is one of these games that we've seen from the Nats this season where they're not scoring, but they're getting on base. And then eventually there is a breakthrough. We have seen that happen with this team this season. Sure enough, we did see this happen to an extent in this game, a two run top of the ninth. And I want to give the Nats credit for that. They're down 2 0 in the ninth inning facing Carlos Estevez, who overall has had a good season. And the Nats rallied and they ended up tying the game. You know, a bunch of singles, as we know, is often the case with the Nats. But Luis Garcia Jr., leadoff single. Juan Yepes following with a single. Jose Tena, RBI single. Then Jacob Young, an RBI fielder's choice grounder. And the game is tied at two. But after that, 
Alex Call strikes out swinging. C.J. Abrams strikes out swinging. There's an interesting development right now with these Davey Martinez lineups. We're actually seeing kind of a back and forth between Abrams and Call in terms of who is batting in the one spot, who is batting in the two spot. We in this game had Call in the one spot, Abrams in the two spot. Call and Abrams combined to go 0 for 9 with three strikeouts. Uh, Abrams did draw a hit by pitch, but that strikeout by Abrams was big. Look, Call struck out too, but you know, at the end of the day, he is Alex Call. CJ Abrams, of course, is here to be an offensive force and in a lot of ways has been this season, although I want to amplify that in a moment. But Abrams striking out with a runner on second, two outs in the game tied at two in the top of the ninth. He in the game goes 0 for 4 with two strikeouts and a hit by pitch. Abrams' overall offensive numbers for this season are not bad. He's number two on the team in terms of qualified Nats and OPS for this regular season. But as we have talked about, he's had this very up and down season, right? Great April, terrible May, great June, terrible July. And he's having now a bad August. His August has not been that good. The truth about Abrams' season is that it's based on two good months. That's it, his April and his June. And beyond those two months, he actually has not been very good offensively. The Nats need this guy to be more consistent and to be more of a force. He can be a great force, but he is not a consistent force. That's for sure. Yeah, that's the next step for him, obviously, is to, you know, you're not going to be all-star caliber six months out of the year, but you'd like to be that guy at least three months and then the other three months just be okay and deliver when your team needs you to. And that ninth inning, they needed him delivered. You've got the other closer on the ropes. Yes, he's already blown the save, but you have a chance to take the lead to finish off that rally and could not do it. And it was a good at bad eight pitches. It's not like he was swinging at everything and just, you know, gave himself up, you know, like Call, who, who saw three pitches in his at bat. But again, Alex Call versus CJ Abrams. Abrams is the guy you want at the plate and you want to believe is going to come through in those spots. And so he does need to find a way to minimize these slumps, to still find a way to give them a good quality at bat in a big spot in a game. We keep saying how important these last six weeks are. I think it applies to almost everybody on the team. The season is not over yet. What you did in the first half is not necessarily what your final numbers at the end of the season are going to show. And we may get to the end and say to ourselves, boy, you know who the best players on this team were? They actually weren't the guys we thought it was at the first part of the season. It's the guys who finish strong and put up better numbers in the end. A long way to go still. Pretty much everybody on this roster still has something they need to prove over the remainder of this season. And I'm including Abrams on that list now, even though we would have said not that long ago that he was a lock, that he was having a great year. He had a great first half. Let's see if he can have at least a decent second half still. Yeah, I'd say he's having a good season. I don't think you can say he's having a great season, and the up and down nature of the season has been tough to take, and especially now with him not having had a truly great month since June, that really stands out, that his July was bad, and you know we thought, okay, well, here comes a good month in August, right, if if you follow the pattern of good month, bad month, but the August so far has not been particularly good, but still about a half of a month to go, so we'll see what Abrams' August ultimately ends up being. James Wood had a good game on Friday evening. Wood, as an ad starting left fielder and number three batter, got on base four times. He went three for three with a double, two singles, and a walk, although he did again get thrown out in an attempted steal. But Wood in the top of the first, a one-out single through the right side of the infield on an 0-2 pitch. Wood in the top of the fourth, a leadoff opposite field infield single to the left side of the infield. Wood in the top of the sixth drew a leadoff walk, but he then was thrown out in an attempted steal of second base. James Wood now just six for 12 on stolen bases since being promoted to the majors. But then came the double. Wood in the top of the eighth, a one out opposite field double to left field on a one two pitch. So continuing to go the opposite way, continuing to do damage in plate appearances in which he's down 0 2 or 1 2. I do think uh, him getting thrown out on the base pass is something that's emerging now, at least to an extent. But man, good game for him overall, getting on base four times. Yeah, I want to see him clean up the base running some along with the defense. These are all the finer points that you hope just with experience he's going to get. But boy, it's hard not to be excited about the at-bats he's putting together. And that last one to me was the biggest one. The double off the lefty, off an all-star lefty. He's now batting 300 against lefties this season, and it's not a small sample. It's 18 for 60. It's not... More at-bats against lefties and righties like it was there for the first few weeks of the season in a bizarre fashion. But he is still, even when 
facing a right-handed starter, he's still getting at least one at bat, sometimes two against lefties late in games. Teams are purposely bringing in the lefties to face him, and he continues to have success against them. I really like that part of his game that he's establishing here. Yes, let's clean up the base running. Let's clean up the defense, but take a step back. And, and again, it's hard not to be impressed in just a month and a half from what we've seen from a 21-year-old. Yeah, I mean, his OPS, 823 since being promoted to the majors. Like, he's not just doing kind of, sort of good. He's doing really well. 373 on base percentage, a 450 slugging percentage. I also want to highlight Jacob Young. Young in this game as an ad starting center fielder and number nine batter. Two for four with a double, a single, an RBI fielder's choice grounder, and a stolen base. And the nature of these plate appearances stuck out. Young in the top of the fifth, a one-out opposite field single to left center field on an 0-2 pitch. Young in the top of the seventh, a two-out opposite field double to the right center field gap on a 1-2 pitch. And Young in that Nats two-run ninth, the RBI fielder's choice grounder to tie the game at two despite having been down at 1.02. And he had to steal a second base. So he turned an 0-2 pitch into a single. He turned a 1-2 pitch into a double. And he worked his way back from being down 0-2 to tie the game via a fielder's choice RBI grounder and then had to steal a second base for good measure. Not bad for your number nine batter. I mentioned uh, Abrams and Call in this game going a combined 0 for 9, but you look at the bottom of the order, Jose Tena and Jacob Young, each with a two-hit performance to go with James Wood having a three-hit game. Luis Garcia Jr. had two singles uh, in this game as well. The Young at-bats, we've been talking about, you know, they don't need him to hit for power. They don't need to be a great offensive player. He just needs to do enough because obviously the defense makes up for everything else. And this was a good example of how he can contribute hitting the ball in the right situations, coming through with that huge clutch RBI, even on the ground ball. That was another good at bat, seven pitches, as you said, behind the count on a lot of these. And that's what he can be. If he can do that, get on base to a good extent, run the base as well, then you can live with a slugging percentage under 400 from your number nine hitter when he's a gold glove caliber center fielder. So that was good to see. Tenna, in spite of the defensive mistake, He has given them something offensively. I don't know if we really know what he is yet, how he fits into this whole thing, but he's come through enough times here early on to say, yeah, let's see a little bit more of that. It's been pretty good at the plate. Bloom may be coming off the rose a little bit for Andres Chaparro, who's been hitting cleanup for them, I guess, just based on his opening night performance and his debut, because since then, there have been a couple walks, a couple decent at-bats, but he hasn't done anything like he did in that first game in Baltimore. And he came up in some big spots after James Wood got on base in this game and did not deliver. And I'll be interested to see how that plays out now as they move forward. Yeah, Chaparro as the Nats starting first baseman, a cleanup batter 0 for 4. Tenna in this game as the Nats starting third baseman and number eight batter 2 for 3. RBI single, another single and a walk. He did get thrown out in an attempt to steal a second base, and he did have a fielding error in the bottom of the second, but it was Tenna, who in the two-run ninth had a full-count RBI single up the middle to cut the Nats' deficit to 2-1. Going back to Call and Abrams, what do you think about that right now with Davey Martinez doing that, not necessarily having Abrams as the number one batter game in, game out? I think there have been a couple reasons for it. One is that Call obviously was you know hitting the cover off the ball for those first couple weeks that he was up here. You try to take advantage of that. And secondly, as we've discussed, Abrams maybe not doing as well. Okay, move him out of the leadoff spot. Maybe he feels a little more comfortable. Maybe having a guy on base in front of him gets him some more fastballs, whatever the case might be. So I think they went hand in hand. You had seen that against the lefties, which you understand. This time they did it against righties. And I believe Davey explained it had to do with Nola's repertoire and feeling like Call was the better leadoff option. Now, it didn't work out, obviously, in this game. Alex works good at bats. You know, see if we can get him on base for the for the other guys up there. But this is just one of those rarities. I do like you know Alex against lefties up there. But this is one one guy I really feel like um, the righties do, do have a better, little bit of better chance just because of that big breaking ball and big cha- change of he has. Call's done a great job under the circumstances, but again, we know what he is, how he fits into this. C.J. Abrams is most likely going to be their leadoff hitter for a long time. So I think I'd rather just stick with him up there and not mess around with that than to try to get cute with it, I guess, would be the way to put it. I understand the options are limited right now. Lane Thomas is gone. Jesse Winker is gone. You don't have a lot of proven 
options to hit in the one, two, three, four spots in your lineup. But I think at this point, I might just say, hey, CJ, you're our leadoff guy. Take the pressure off. Just go up there, do what you know how to do, and try to get on base and hit the ball hard when you get a chance. Another hit by pitch that is drawn by Abrams. That's now 15 on the regular season. He has this uh, Roblesian penchant for drawing hit by pitches. I'm not sure that you want that from a, a star player, right? Because the propensity for injury is there. But boy, 15 hit by pitches now drawn by Abrams. And I don't think he does anything unusual. It's not like he dives over the plate all the time. He's not looking for them like some other guys we've seen over the years. I guess the book on him is pitch him inside and too many guys are coming way inside on him. Thankfully, he hasn't caused any injury and he's getting some easy uh, points to his on-base percentage and he'll take that. But I, I don't know how to explain that one. He doesn't strike me as the prototypical guy who gets hit by pitches the way we think of like those grinders who just stick the elbow guard on and stick your arm out and hope you get hit by pitch. And that's actually a part of your game. I don't think it's supposed to be a part of CJ's game. Walters is hosting the ultimate Nats watch party this Saturday night at six o'clock while the team is in Philadelphia. An exclusive raffle will be held. Prizes include a pair of tickets and $25 gift cards to the concession stand. Here's your AAA report for the game played on Friday night. Dylan Cruz with a single out of the leadoff spot. Brady House, a single while hitting third. Stone Garrett, a single and a double, the only extra base hit for the Red Wings. And on the mound, the best outing yet this season for the left-hander Andrew Alvarez. Seven innings pitch, struck out five, allowed just one run. Now back to the show. The pitch. Swing and a high fly ball, deep left center field, back towards the Bermuda Triangle, and it's out of here. Dylan Cruz with a long two-run homer, and the Red Wings extend the lead to 8-1. to one. Regarding something we talked about on the last installment of the podcast, when might the Nats promote Dylan Cruz to the majors? So as Mark was talking about, you have this threshold of it's 130 at-bats or 45 total days on an active major league roster in order to maintain rookie status. The idea is you want Cruz to still have rookie status for next season so that the Nats could potentially get a PPI draft pick for Cruz if he happens to have a really good season and finishes highly in National League Rookie of the Year voting. Now, here's what's interesting. If you go by MLB.com, so MLB.com defines rookie status as 130 at-bats or 50 innings pitched in the major leagues or 45 total days on an active major league roster during, as MLB.com terms it, the championship season. So if you're talking about 45 total days, the regular season ends on September 29th. The regular season actually ends kind of early this year. It's a weird calendar. We had the super late All-Star break, but the end of the regular season actually is fairly early you know, relative to other seasons, September 29th. So we're already at that 45-day mark. But I'm curious about this. MLB.com says 130 at-bats. Is it at-bats or plate appearances? Because <laughs> you, you think about what could be if Cruz is at 129, quote-unquote, at-bats, and then like draws a walk to not register an official at bat. Does that mean that he didn't reach 130 at bat? So I'd, I'd be curious to know if it in fact is at bats or plate appearances. The language says at bats. So I, I guess that's what it is. And if you've got a good eye at the plate and know how to work the count, good for you. You you can avoid, although maybe in his case, he doesn't want to avoid. He, he wants to get the uh, the full status. I don't know. It's pretty esoteric what we're talking about here. And I, I don't know why that's not a little more clear cut as how that works. You would think it should be plate appearances, not at bats. But the language says at bats. And as far as I know, that's what it actually is. So Friday was August 16th, 15 days left in August, and then 29 days in September till the end of the regular season. So that's 44 days. So in theory, we are on Dylan Cruz watch here. So as we discussed, maybe he gets promoted to the majors for the upcoming series against the Colorado Rockies for this Tuesday through Thursday. Maybe it's not until the three game set against the New York Yankees, August 26th through August 28th. But yeah, Dylan Cruz time could be coming very soon. So game three for the Nats uh, at the Phillies Saturday evening at 6.05. Mackenzie Gore will be the Nats starting pitcher prior to Every recent Gore start, we have said he needs to have a good start. We will say it again right now. He needs to have 
a good start. His recent starts have been really bad. Obviously, this is a tough spot. Saturday night at the Phillies should be a packed house at the sit. Phillies lineup, very good. And I don't know, man. I mean, on the one hand, it's like, how can you be super optimistic? On the other hand, in sports so often, like when you think something, there's no way that it can happen. It does happen. So maybe Gore does end up pitching well. But boy, him pitching well would be very welcomed by the Nats. This is a gut check start for him. Let's put it out there like that. This guy has the talent. He has the mentality that says, I want to be the best. I want to face the best. Okay, you're going to get Schwarber, Turner, Harper, Real Muto, Bohm, Castellanos, all of them. And it's time to show it, you know? It doesn't mean this is a make or break start for him one way or the other, but this is the stage he wants to be on. He wants to prove that he can be the guy you can count on against a good hitting team like this. So let's see it. He, supposedly they worked on things in the bullpen. They had some specific things they wanted to address this week. I don't know exactly what they are. Let's watch what the velocity is because as I noted, it was down a little bit in the last start. He insisted that physically he was feeling fine. So the insinuation there is that there's something mechanically that might have led to that. Let's see. This is a gut check start for him. It's time to show everyone if he can be what he says and what everybody believes he can be. And I'm not saying that it's make or break. And if he has a bad one, well, that's it. Or if he has a great start, okay, he's cured. But boy, it'd be nice to see that. And it could change the whole narrative of this and get the ball back in his corner as he tries to establish himself as a legitimate frontline big league starting pitcher. If he does well, great. If he doesn't do well, then what? Because the Nats have been kind of, you know, holding off on doing anything drastic with Gore, optioning him to AAA, skipping a start, et cetera. If this doesn't go well, if this is, you know, like what happened with Mitchell Parker on Thursday evening, you know, you feel like something is going to have to give because it just can't continue like this with Gore. So we'll see. Big spot for Mackenzie Gore on Saturday evening. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by tonight's Scooby-Doo Night for the Fred Nats in Fredericksburg, Virginia. First round pick, Seaver King, and the rest of the Fred Nats will be taking the field in Scooby-Doo themed jerseys. Get your tickets now at frednats.com forward slash tickets. You can hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the podcast, Nats Chat Podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on our website, Nats Chat Podcast.com. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. For Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. Runners second and third, two out, 5 nothing Nationals, bottom of the first. Swing and a fly ball, left field toward the line. Ozuna on the run, can't get there, drops in for a base hit. Scoring is Robles behind him, coming in from second is Gomes on a single to left. Two runs batted in for Trey Turner. Seven runs home here in the bottom of the first inning. The hole be charged to the starter, Dakota Hudson, with two out of the bottom of the first inning. Ten Nationals have batted. It's Washington 7, St. Louis nothing. Unbelievable. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash Blue Wire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed.